Um, welcome everybody. Good afternoon. Nice to see all of you here today. My name is Dr. Elizabeth Kolsky. I am the director of the LePage Center for History and the Public Interest at Villanova University, where I am also an associate professor. And some of you are have been with us now for several months. We're into our fifth month of programming um, on decolonizing history, which is our overarching theme. Um, oops. Sorry, can, I don't know what to do about it. All I can do can, is I just would like to ask people to uh, mute uh, your microphone. About getting too involved with like a human resources know. issue. And I'm muting people, but so I don't know people. Which one. Okay. There we go. Great. So uh, we're into our fifth month of programming. Those of you who've been with us now for a while know that we're exploring this overarching theme of decolonizing history, um, which is really about. Um, questioning historical knowledge. What, you know, whose stories do we know about? Whose stories rise to the top and whose get lesser attention and why? So it's a, we're kind of exploring and, and um, different ways of decolonizing history. Every month, for those of you who have been with us, we explore a different kind of sub theme. So we've decolonized the curriculum, then we looked at land, then we looked at the Catholic church. Um, last month, we looked at the question of empire. And this month we're looking at decolonizing art. And we have three excellent um, panels lined up over the next three weeks, each of which kind of addresses the question of the arts from a slightly different perspective. So we hope we put these events together in the hopes that you'll stay with us for all three. But of course, we know that this is sort of depending on your schedule. So just to give you a little bit of an overview, today we are looking at decolonizing art and uh, with uh, Dr. Monique Scott, who is the Director of Museum Studies down the road from Villanova at Bryn Mawr. Next week, we have an evening roundtable discussion of decolonizing museums, which will look at sort of past and present histories of race and representation in the museum space. And then the third event, which is gonna be on March 17th at 1230, we're gonna look at indigenous art and indigenous curatorial perspectives. So we really hope that you'll be able to stick with us um, and we're super, super excited about this month. So without further ado, I would like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Tim McCall, who is an associate professor of art history and my co-collaborator on this month's series. And he will introduce the speaker um, and take it away, Boss McCall. Okay, thank you. So I, I'm, I'm gonna keep this brief, but I'm very, very excited about this, about this month and particularly about um, Dr. Monique Scott visiting us who is the, like, like my colleague Elizabeth said, director of the Museum Studies Program at Bryn Mawr College. Dr. Scott received her PhD in anthropology from Yale and also has a background in biogenetics, which I, you know, um, I think gives her a very interesting perspective in, in, um, in, in, in the, at least a lot of the work that I've, I've read recently. Um, Dr. Scott worked for a decade in museum education at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And while she was there, published her 2007 book, Rethinking Evolution in the Museum, Envisioning African Origins, which is sort of in between, or uh, it means all of these things, anthropology, um, colonial, about the history of colonial knowledge, museum studies, cultural history. It also takes very seriously visitor engagement in museums, and which is another, um, I think, obviously very val valuable perspective. Um, and since moving to Philly, maybe five or six, um, or to Philly five or six years ago, working at Bryn Mawr, has been involved in um, at the Penn Museum and their um, African galleries at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, um, co-curated a show at the ICA um, called Quotidian Past, part of the Colored People, Colored People Time um, series of exhibitions, thinking about colonial practices of collection uh, and, and of collecting. So um, I, well, join me in welcoming Dr. Monique Scott. And this is built as a conversation, but I'm totally really gonna be in the background. And I just wanna let you you know, talk for maybe about 40 minutes or so, and then we'll have a good 15, 20 minutes for, for questions from possibly from me, but definitely from the, from the audience as well. Thank you, thank you so much. I am going to share my screen to share slides, but um, much thanks to you, um, Elizabeth um, and Tim for inviting me to be part of this valuable series. Um, and yes, in in better times, I am down the street at Bryn Mawr and hopefully, you know, in not too 
distant future, we can collaborate in, in person. And I, I do hope this is the beginning of, uh, you know, many future collaborations. Uh, you all are doing amazing things. Um, all right, so um, I slightly edited my title, the title of the talk here, to the, the problems of decolonizing art, uh, race, museums, um, and constructions of, of Africa. And a quick word here, um, and Tim mentioned them, about like the various hats that I wear um, and about the roles that you see there. So um, I, am, I, I am proud to be both an academic and someone that works in museums, a museum professional. Um, and at Bryn Mawr, I wear various hats um, and have been really proud to design the museum studies program there. Um, and I think one that is uh, uniquely uh, and deeply political. Um, and I also uh, do research um, on the history of the Bryn Mawr African, uh, African art collections there. So I'm going to uh, talk about my research on uh, how early museums and anthropology have produced visual codes for uh, promoting racial hierarchies. And, and this, um, you know, as, a, as an undergraduate, I uh, actually started working in museums. I started working at this museum, the American Museum of Natural History in 1993 when I was doing genetic summer research there. Um, so throughout my time at, at Vassar College, while I was a bio major and anthro minor, and then throughout graduate school, um, I, I have worked in this museum in particular um, every summer and then as part of my dissertation work and always sort of um, as a bioanthropologist first, deeply concerned with um, the entrenched messages about racial hierarchy as we see depicted here in this Teddy Roosevelt statue, uh, Teddy Roosevelt flanked by a, a, a generic image of, a, of, a, of an African and a Native American, which is coming down next month um, from outside the museum. Um, but I have been really concerned about kind of the residues of racial hierarchies um, in museums. And this, this museum in particular um, is very much in, in my blood. I, as, as, as Tim said, I worked there after my postdoc, I worked there for 10 years from 2005. 2015, um, doing anthropological education. And it was, um, I always say my relationship with museums and especially this museum is like a, 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 lo a toxic love story. <laughs> um, I'm deeply in love with this museum, but it has been a tumultuous relationship. Um, but I still contribute and, and work there and um, believe in, in working in museums to create change. All right, so just today, kind of the lineup of things, one of the, some of the things I want to talk about. So first, this sort of moment, quote unquote, there have been other moments uh, uh, that is under the umbrella of decolonize the museum, which at best suggests museums have to rethink their relationship uh, to white supremacy and um, their rethink their relationship to the objects they've collected and display um, and the communities they represent. And I've been involved in this kind of uh, decolonized industry unintentionally um, with, with art intentionally with various museums in the Philadelphia area, such as the Academy of Natural Sciences and, um, and, the, uh, and the, the American Museum of Natural History, the Penn Museum, um, and so, so that that has been great. I'll talk a little bit more about this, uh, the, the problematics, as you are aware of, of the word, of the wording um, in a moment. And then as for my research, um, Tim mentioned this 2007 book, which I really wanted the title to be Envisioning African Origins and the subtitle to be <laughs> Evolution in the Museum. It's reversed, but I refer to it as Envisioning African Origins. Um, it all, it, it, you know, it's now seems 
quite dated um, in and over itself, in and of itself, you know, being over 10 years ago, but it was very much about how race in Africa was constructed in physical anthropology exhibits historically and today in four museums, uh, the American Museum of Natural History, the National Museums of Kenya, um, the Horniman Museum in London, and the Natural History Museum in London. Um, and uh, more recently, my work has been, um, oh, I should mention why you're looking at the top image. So what the major finding of that work was that teleological color-coded progress narratives from the late 19th century, to early 20th century still reside in museums today in various ways, whether it's encoded in museum exhibits um, or in something museum visitors bring with them to the museum, this notion of black evolutionary and cultural inferiority persists widely um, in pop culture and politics, the popular imagination. Um, and in many ways, race science and racial folklore and, and museums co-constructed this, this image of, of Africa. Um, and I was also interested very much in how museums were part of their uh, cultural milieu, milieu uh, um, apart, not apart from socio-political discourse, often using a shared uh, uh, vocabulary or symbolic vocabulary or lexicon um, for producing ideas and historically in the first museums and also true today and, and in the future. I will also touch on my new research, which is conducting archival histories um, of, of African collections. And this has mostly been at the Penn Museum, but also in, in the Bryn Mawr collections. And again, a plug for the Bryn Mawr African collections, we have quite a robust collection for a small liberal arts college. Um, and you know, we are we are able to do some 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 interesting research on those. Um, political research on, on the history of those collections. And then lastly, I'll talk about some exhibits um, I've worked on and, and mostly I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the new African galleries at the Penn Museum uh, curated by Takufu Zuberi. So, um, as 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 you know, we're at we're at a we're at a critical moment here, um, and in museums, and battles over race and class and image and ideology have been brought to the fore uh, over the past four or five years uh, by decolonize this place activists. Um, and as an anthropologist that studies museums, I've been thinking about their significance. Um, uh, historically and today uh, as, as, as powerful rhetoric in the construction of an idea uh, about humanity and about blackness um, in particular. Um, and they certainly, and I'll, I'll get more into this later, have produced certain images such as of, of Africa, Africa an evolutionary or primitive spectacle. Um, as in, th these are images from uh, 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 inside the American Museum of Natural History, and that's outside the Hall of African Peoples. Um, and so the museums have become sites of, of protest for their, their roles in producing and reproducing um, these, these, the image of Africa as static, yeah. uh, primitive, unevolved. And I think, you know, why are we still having to argue that Black Lives Matter and, um, you know, what legacy does, I'm, haunted by this question and 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 almost uh, it, it's everywhere in and in, in the news um and it's it's i keep thinking like why are we still arguing this uh why do we still have to arguing for the the that black lives matter um and i'm thinking about the legacy it has in early museum work and anthropology work and the race science that happened in museums such as the penn museum and the american museum of natural history and thinking about the residues of that in um in museums today and the larger cultural matrix of which they are part um and how do we reconcile these deeply entrenched pseudoscientific ideas about how black lives do not indeed matter <laughs> ...and 
And I know that museums and anthropology helped construct these ideas. So I, as an anthropologist of museums, want to think about how we can deconstruct them in museums. So you've thought about decolonizing throughout this year, this series of, of talks. And um, so I'm stating probably what much, much of you already know. Um, again, I've been working um, in this realm intentionally or unintentionally um, uh, as part of this wider kind of academic or institution, uh, institutional decolonizing industry. And you know, decolonize has become a metaphor for uh, destabling white supremacy in public spaces and institutions. Um, but um, I think Tim mentioned that many of you have read and are familiar with the Tuck and Yang article, decolonization um, is, is not a metaphor. And I also see that at Villanova as part of the series um, you've questioned the meaning of decolonize and its very real relationship to indigenous uh, land repatriation. Um, and I, I will add that this was this this was brought to my attention um, uh, most recently by um, a colleague at Bryn Mawr College, a fantastic college colleague who is with us today, Allison Mills, who was our college archivist, um, who um, is is Cree and uh, who is um, also a, a, a scholar of Indigenous studies, um, and she brought she brought this to our in attention in important ways and how we're using the word uh, decolonize. Um, I also I have some more kind of I have some other sort of maybe less substantive. Um, beefs or concerns with with the industry for which I am gratefully part of. Um, you know, it's really odd. I, I was, you know, I've been doing this work on kind of white supremacy in museums, not calling it that way, calling it in those terms, perhaps for a long time. So when when there was this growing interest in in decolonizing museums, I, I my work had a kind of a renewed urgency and I was like, this is fantastic, but this is also really odd. You know, I've been thinking about this for 20 years. Um, and we know, you know, it's, 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 it's why it has renewed kind of resonance, but being part of this um, sort of, uh, industry I, I I sometimes got kind of like a fatigue with the word I'm just wondering you know how it cannot how it can be more than like a buzzword or fashion and um, in museums we have we want to have more rich conversations about uh, how museums can own their past tell new stories embrace new ontologies or ways of knowing about cultural objects embrace new audiences and not just in you know black history month or um native american heritage month um you know we have to think about how to make institutional change in hierarchies and staffing and salaries and power um and you know i, I there are so many decolonized the museum conferences that are happening within museums within museums such as the pitt rivers museums the archetypal uh, ethnographic museum. And I've, I've just wondered like, you know, what does it mean to happen for these conversations up within? Oh, and you have Dan Hicks coming, I think next week. And that's an example of, of powerful change. I mean, the, the book, his book is um, phenomenal and part of the sea change. Um, but, you know, I just have to keep questioning, like, what does it mean <laughs> for us to say we're decolonizing um, on museums, like how is this, you know, we have to press for strategic institutional um, change in, in institutional racism. Um, and then also my other kind of, it's a question or, or um, maybe not a concern, but my recent research on the history of African objects in, in museum collections is actually a specific focus um, on the political histories of objects. It's um, at the, you know, looking at the intersections of collecting and colonialism or slavery or the art market or missionary work. So it's actually kind of recentering um, the, the, the colonial or colonization in some ways. And then I, 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 I just wanna briefly mention that I, I, after, and we read this in a, in a book club meeting at, a, at Bryn Mawr College, um, 
thanks to Allison. And then we, I also, and we've discussed how, I don't think the Tuck and Yang article has aged well. Um, and there is this article, which you may, uh, in light of Black Lives Matter movement, um, and in some ways, in the ways it pitted the indigenous movement against um, some movements as we as African slave descendants have been involved in. So I just wanted to call your attention to this, um, this response um, article, which I think is so from 2020. Um, and also mention, and you know, mentioning more here because this is part of this series, um, that you know there have been some gains from the decolonize this place you know activism um and in in particular you know the the and the founders of of the of decolonize this place were which were um latinx and indigenous people they've they've um their initiatives have been um have created some real institutional change. So such, you know, they ask for change in, in leadership and in, in, in addressing needs and financial um, inequities uh, for BIPOC staff of museums and of American Museum of Natural History in particular. And they had a really active, like palpable active role in like the Teddy Roosevelt statue coming down. Um, out, coming down next month um, at the American Museum of Natural History. Okay, so moving on to um, my research, my earlier research, um, you know, so after, well, while, while working um, in, in anthropological education, um, after, at the American Museum of Natural History uh, for those 10 years. I, I, I was very interested in the residues of 19th century um, race science. Hold on one second, I'm getting my place. And you know, this started while I was um, a graduate, a graduate student um, in bioanthropology. Um, and you know, many of you perhaps are familiar with these images, this history, um, and it's important to keep bearing in mind this 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 important kind of these historical images of Africa and the museum and anthropology. Um, you know, and as I'm just briefly mentioning here, but throughout this long history of world's fairs, such as the African villages in the 1893 Columbian Exposition. Um, the quote unquote hot and top Venus, the Khoisan woman on display around Europe in the early 19th century, and uh, Oda Benga, the quote unquote pygmy exhibited at the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair and in 1906 at the Bronx Zoo, African peoples have been used to perform race according to the whims um, of a Western ontological quest as Ed Wil Wilson said um, many years ago in Land Filled with Flies. So, uh, I continued with uh, this this concern, um, this interest, um, you know, through throughout graduate school, um, and really honed in on anthropological museum representations of Africa, perhaps you know particularly those at the American Museum of Natural History, which. Uh, had the first, well, in 1924, they had one of the first um, human evolution exhibits, which is Hall of the Age of Man, um, uh, curated by the renowned paleontologist and devoted eugenicist Henry Fairfield Osborne. But also as part of my dissertation research, I looked at, as I mentioned, the Natural History Museum in London, which included the diorama on the right um, as part of an otherwise progressive human evolution exhibit. Um, I also did a pilot study in 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 South Africa, um, and you know, throughout I just became concerned about um, how there's a sort of like um, this 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 visual shorthand of Africa as as African peoples as as primitive um, persisted um, in in museums and how these early bioanthropological narratives constructed through images um, 
uh, a way of seeing Africa, uh, uh, which have contributed to and contribute to cultural and ontological understandings of race and blackness, reasoning that informed and allowed for practices of slavery and that continue to perpetuate forms of social dominance and material disenfranchisement. Um, as Jennifer Gonzalez's work has, has helped uh, me think about. So while um, while working at A AMNH for those for those for those years, um, I was interested in, in in the residues of 19th century race science bestializing Africa in their current and they are still current um, museum in their current exhibitions um, today. So at the American Museum of Natural History and maybe at any museum, you, there's kind of a you have to create or communicate an imaginary Africa to audiences in these reductive um, metonymic landscapes, um, the landscape of the museum exhibition. You know, how do you sum up Africa in any museum exhibit? But as part of the African meta narrative at the AMH, as, as Miki Bell has written about, we move from the Teddy Roosevelt statue outside of the museum um, with, with an African man by his side almost directly to the Akeley Hall of African mam mammals from, with the you know, gorilla diorama there and you know, a parade of African elements and, and, um, you know, and, and the focus on, on animals, taxidermic animals. You move from there around the corner to the, um, to the Hall of African Peoples um, with dioramas such as the two on the left there um, the top one of, of quote unquote pygmies in the rainforest, um, and uh, the bottom one of of of, Masa of the Maasai, um, and you know this 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 is you know you still see you're seeing and millions of school children are seeing African people confined you know to these to these imagined jungles and plains with the suggestion of evolutionary determinism. Um, and then in the Hall of Human Origins, um, you know, there are sort of a, a color coded hierarchy of progress with dark, darker species, darker humans, um, pre humans uh, representing the, the, the er earlier t in time, human evolutionary time, as we might expect, but the one representative of modern humanity, of modern humans, sorry, the human species is this a diorama on the bottom right of, of modern humans in um, the Ukraine. So, you know, we can, these are not resigned to history, you know, these, this, this image of, of Africa, they, 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 that persists in, in museums. And again, as I said, in popular culture, um, this and this idea by the book was about this teleological march of progress, this color-coded march of progress that is still very much embedded in many of us, many people. Um, and I was, you know, intellectually inspired to do this work, but it also, you know, it personally pained me as a person who loved science and loved physical anthropology. Um, and so something else that has pained me is this what has been what has happened what is I would like to think of it as the past political moment but it's very much among us um, but this is you know a group of of uh, confederate supporters voicing opposition to the removal of a confederate monument in 2017 and we can point we all of us many of us <laughs> have poignantly uh, realized painfully realized that um, you know this is a monument is not just um, a monument. And Charlottesville taught us that our work is not only about the preservation of museum objects, it's to find our voice in a country that is using symbols and monuments to fight race wars, uh, to use Confederate monuments to enact the ugliest forms of anti-Black racism. Um, and so the Teddy Roosevelt monument is not just a neutral neutral monument. It's much, much more than that. We've all um, witnessed this in, in, in rethinking uh, the power um, of, of monuments. Um, and so, you know, as a as a as an anthropologist and a museum person and as a black woman and uh, an American and a human. So I've been really troubled by by this um, 
you know, the popular and political discourse about Africa and blackness um, that kind of emerged with um, the Trump presidency um, and the rise of white nationalist violence um, around the preservation of Confederate monuments. Um, and, you know, I also, I was interested in how that reverberated in other spheres. This was something I, you know, I've always been interested in. I have many examples, but um, I will briefly run through them. The president, the former president, former disgraced one term, twice impeached president, reducing the African diaspora to uh, shit old countries. Um, Ann Coulter's social Darwinist claims that in the history of the world, there has never been a more pacific, less rapey creature than the white male of Western European descent. Um, the relentless depiction of the Obamas as primates, there was the Roseanne Barr slur against Valerie Jarrett. There's many, many, many examples. Um, and, you know, this, not terribly new, you know, there's black people have long been bestialized in popular media, film, fashion, and uh, marketing, sports. Um, I was surprised to learn the Wikipedia definition of monkey chance is referring to this common phenomenon um, in, in, in soccer. And, you know, museums continue in, to be part of that public sphere, continuing to traffic in these outdated ideologies, even celebrating them. So this, this was a party held by the Dassault organization at the Africa Museum in Belgium, um, where attendees playfully wore blackface and colonial garb um, to the to the event. The museum quickly, you know, put out an apology. And yet, um, so there are many more, unfortunately, examples. Um, but. Moving on to, to interventions, um, I'm sure many of you recognize this image from Black Panther with its finger on the pulse in 2018. Um, you know, but for all of those reasons, the, the, what has been happening the last four or five years, what's been happening the last 10, 20 years, 100 years, um, I, you know, I've been, I've been kind of motivated to think about how to, um, intervene um, in popular, you know, stereotypes or constructions of blackness. Um, and also it's why the currency of my original research really stays stays with me. Um, it's political, politically resonant. It's, it's, re it's relevant uh, to me and Black Lives Matter and, and uh, police brutality and, and many things that we feel and witness. Um, so inspired to, to intervene, as I mentioned, inspired to always work um, in museums and with museums um, to try to create change. <clears throat> and some of this has happened at Bryn Mawr College. I won't be able to get into it much today, um, but I will talk probably more about the, the top two, the Penn Museum exhibition and the um, ICA exhibition, which both focused on some archival research that that I, I did. Um, so, uh, so this work has been motivated by this research question, um, you know, how can the collection archives uncover the colonial practices that produced ways of seeing Africa that have persistent visual residues in museums? Um, and this, it, it was brought about, um, in part, oh, in this image, I am, I'm writing an article about this, this image, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about it later, this photograph, this constructed photograph um, from a, um, it was in the Penn Museum archives of Amandus Johnson, it's a campsite photo in Angola from 1924, and his, his story is beyond rich and surprising and scandalous. Um, so I became part of the curatorial team for the newly imagined African galleries at the Penn Museum, um, selected by Takufu Zuberi to be part of this, this team. Um, 
And this was not a normal exhibition development ride with Takufu at the helm. Um, he's a renowned sociologist uh, that has studied African politics for over 30 years. Um, but from the beginning, he has said, we're not, you know, this exhibition is going to do something different. You know, it's going to be about kind of the, the he would say, it's kind of about the heart of darkness um, and uh, the vision of, of that Westerners held of Africa from the late 1880s onward. Um, and he wanted, um, you know, that the, the, this exhibition to also be about the history of the collection as evidenced by the archives and the title of the exhibition is from maker to museum. Um, so for contrast, this is the previous exhibit, um, uh, the African gallery installed over 25 years ago. So conventional in many ways, they have a very large uh, um, African collections. I think one of the, the largest in the, definitely in the United States in regards to Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, this is the new entrance to the exhibition. You can see it's there's new ways of seeing already. Um, uh, with the, this one entrance has this replica of a gate in, in Brazil from Portofino that looks out to Africa was from what was once a slave slave port. Um, and you know there was a recontextualization of traditional African art uh, with more uh, with contemporary art from around the diaspora. So everything was a bit kind of shaken and stirred in ways to make new meanings. And the archival research that I did, and I did with um, some Bryn Mawr students, made it into the exhibition in more and less conspicuous ways, um, such as in this letter um, that we found from um, the brother of a colonial officer uh, in Benin. And there's archival research ends up in other ways, less conspicuously, such as in the interactives and interspersed throughout the exhibit. So a um, brief mention here, this was the exhibition at the Institute of Contemporary Art um, that I co-curated with the amazing uh, Meg Only, the Penn ICA curator Meg Only in her three chapter show about black temporality. Um, and we were, I was able to get in various stories about um, uh, different figures in the history of Penn's African collections and um, an art dealer featured in the, on the bottom two images um, and an ethnographer and his wife, um, Amandis Johnson, who I'll return to here, um, who was, so this, this was the image uh, the reproduced for the exhibition. Um, and again, I, I could speak a lot about this image, but um, it's powerful as a construction. Um, but Mandis Johnson, who led the expedition in the early 1920s, um, you know, he was not an Africanist anthropologist. He was not an ethnographer. Um, he was a professor of Scandinavian languages that went to Angola um, to learn about the cultures there, possibly to steal a cache of diamonds that a German scholar had left there. This is all documented in museum letters. You can't make it up. Uh, well, either way, he used the lucrative funds from his popular African lecture tours to build a museum of Scandinavian heritage here um, in, in Philadelphia and one that touted the, the white supremacy of the Scandinavian people. It's a, just an incredible and, and um, incredible uh, story. Uh, I also was involved uh, in the an exhibition at the American Museum of Natural History about the statue, um, and you know again, uh, we it is coming down next month. I can talk more about that that process. It was odd to be involved in this <laughs> for various reasons, um, but I I feel proud that it's a returning to Amity to 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 kind of be part of some of the changes happening there. So in close, so yes, we, I believe we have to keep our hands on our history as you all are doing with this, this series. Um, but that definitely those of us working in museums, um, we have to as, as, as reclaim and, and reimagine as the flyers say, um, 
uh, from the protest within the American Museum of Natural History. But I've seen through my work um, that excavating museum histories an object are challenging but liberating and politically powerful. And for me with this work, I personally hope that by putting whiteness on display in subtle ways in exhibitions about Africa, we can reveal the productions of symbols and semiotics used in creating this heart of darkness, white racial fantasy so that we can begin to radically undo it. And that is the end. Thank you. All right, seven. thank you, Monique. Um, and Dr. Kolsky, do we open questions, um, sorry, via chat? Or I have, I, I have a first question. Um, I, I have about two pages worth of questions, um, but hold on, I'm waiting for Is that all right, Elizabeth? Yeah, I would say, you know, we, we encourage, this is the uh, Center for History and the Public Interest. So we call on the public to engage with us. Um, but yeah, so if you, you know, th this particular format, you can raise a question, you, know, you can raise your hand or you can post a question in the chat if that makes you feel more comfortable. But yeah, we'd love to hear, uh, we'd love to hear your question, Tim. Okay, well, yeah, and so everyone else, just please raise your hand or, or put it in the chat to, to everyone or to Dr. Kolsky or myself. Um, but I guess my, my first one is kind of a general one, just to maybe to continue the conversation is, um, you know, particularly because you talked about some of the, you know, how maybe Tuck and Yang ha uh, haven't aged well, right? But um, what what are the challenges um, or maybe limitations or impossibilities for decolonizing a museum, Dr. Scott, um, it, like in the next, well, in the immediate future? Yeah, and um, it's not, right, possible to decolonize, <laughs> even using it in the new sense of the, of the word. Um, you know, to, to take away, you know, that's all, how many times did I say residue? Like, like to take away kind of this history that lives in the museum, I think we can call attention to it and do better in terms of how the institutions are structured and what they put out into the world. Um, but, and you know, it's interesting that, so the Penn Museum is having a conference um, in the fall of 2021, it originally was called decolonize something, something. And they have, and you know, it has been changed now to the problems of decolonizing. Um, because I think all of us, you know, working in these realms and probably throughout your series, um, you know, there's, yes, is it, is it about the recreation of indigenous land? No, that's not what the, I mean, I don't, I don't know if the Penn Museum will be engaged in that dialogue, but that's not what is the concern. For them, I think it's about um, trying to make the museum more democratic, reach out to more audiences. I feel like that's some of the goals, um, you know, from the institution. Um, but you know, I, 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 it's, it's, I don't know what it would look like to effectively, completely, radically, you know, transform, and something like an anthropology and ar archaeology, anthropology and archaeology museum. I see there's some colleagues here from other, um, from art museums, um, John Vick and Alexis, um, and and from PAFA, you know, but it's. I think that's a, it's a, it's a really, it's a, I, but I'm not nihilistic. I don't think we should not do anything because it's not possible. We should make changes <laughs> within the institutions. Well then, and maybe take that the next step, then what, what, what are some possibilities beyond, beyond sort of denaturalizing museums and denaturalizing power to, to um, that are available when sort of excluded communities are and excluded interpretive communities are, engaged in the museum a lot more and a brought in so what how can meaning be produced um do you think moving produce, forward in new ways produce new meanings it's like you know at the american museum of natural history when there was increasing dialogue with some communities from um some indigenous communities from the northwest coast um and you know boaz was at that museum and there's a long history of a relationship with various northwest coast communities um there we we started they started to create new um actual um and this was in the catalog 
entries, but new interpretations based on the learning so that there were multiple interpretations, multiple ways of knowing about these objects. Um, and that can happen in labels as well, um, so that you're you're revealing multiple ways of knowing that these objects, you know, didn't just kind of drop into the museum, and then you know this 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 the exhibition label is this you know objective truth, like just offering. And at the Penn Museum, I think one of the really the, the great things that happened with interpretation is that. Uh, there were multiple ways of, of, of uh, in that tombstone label and the label underneath an object, um, you know, there was a description of where, where the object came from and meaning like how it got to the museum. Um, I think just by opening up new spaces, ways of, of sharing, um, multiple ways of knowing and seeing and opening that up to the public and, op and letting the museum those of us working in museums see that process and be aware of that process. Like with the Teddy Roosevelt statue, you know, it's not the statue coming down that is the biggest <laughs> sign of progress. It's what the conversations that had to happen within the museum. Wait, Teddy Roosevelt's not just like this hero or like great naturalist, you know, he also was a eugenicist. Like the, the learning that happens within the museum um, is, is also important. Thank you, yeah. I'll let um, Tim Horner ask the next question and, and then there are a couple in the chat. Hi, yeah, thanks very much. This is like super interesting. I, I teach class on genocide and I use those images. Um, some of those, I actually have a question about one of the images that you had up at the beginning on one of your early slides, the knot and glidden thing yeah. from 1857, those, yeah. those representations of the races. Yes, and um, so to speak that one I actually use and I have a question for you about it. Um, I've speculated in class if you look at the illustration and maybe you can share it again to have people look at it like the the illustrations of the people do not match up with the skulls that are on the right no. hand side. No, They're clearly disconnected from one another and yet they are inviting the reader to see connections and descent in things that don't match up right in front of them. And I'm just wondering, did people at the time realize that these images don't match up with the skulls, don't match up with the illustrations at uh, all? Yes, yes. Okay, so here, I have many comments about this, but um, is it here again? Uh, right. One more, but yeah, there it is. Image yeah. on the far left. And also, you know, Stephen Gold wrote about this in The Mismeasure of Man from what the 1980s, I think. Uh, Yes, and also the skull of um, the, is it the quote unquote Negro is artificially exaggerated for that to, to, to show the cognitism, to show the similarity um, seemingly to apes. But um, it's, it, you know, I don't, I can't speak for people of the time, but that was not, it was, um, they were clearly intentionally like putting out, and as you know, probably from your course, putting out, putting this together as as um, as political, you know, as political rhetoric. And yeah, there have been um, there have been, you know. Yes, there's been met much talk about, I mean, not in Glidden, and this is a Penn connection as well, University of Pennsylvania connection as well. Um, yes, I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was falsely constructed and the science was false. And this, you know, I, you know, I first read about it in the 1980s, whatever, from Stephen Jay Gould. I look back because, you know, is you know, there's a popular reading, but it's, um, it really goes into how these these images were constructed, and there was a recent article actually, and I get into this a little more in in the book, but about how, so not just the skulls were were falsely constructed, but the um and the and the data around them, but um, the re, the artistic reconstructions, uh, the subjectivity that goes into them, 
in human evolution exhibits in you know in anthropology museums it's 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 uh that's a huge interest there was a recent article actually that that came out um that was basically about the reconstruction of the of the of, of the lucy skeleton um but yes these are that's just like a something that needs to be really yes out there acknowledged like these are but these are it, not object these are not objective i don't know what is it was it fair to say that it's an indication of the disconnect the cognitive i'm trying to get my students sometimes to see like what you don't notice is sometimes the most important thing like if no one really was calling it out at the time even if it's in a scientific journal these these scientific things like did people just kind of take it for granted because they wanted to see it i don't think everybody i actually don't think everybody took it for granted even in that moment okay i don't think you know we do this like it's you know that of that moment it was of that moment but you know franz boas was vehemently arguing against this type of race science and he was a person that studied skulls before he became our you know our our the, the father of, of cultural anthropology and cultural relativism more progressive cultural anthropology um the people were calling this out at the time um however and there's also a way in which and i got into this a little bit that images circulate as common sense so like the more you put these images out there the more we start to internalize or believe them so even if there's like science or political like uh, reaction to them or against them you know that march of progress going from dark to light like it's every it's everywhere it's in, i see it everywhere now that i'm you know looking in a way i can't unsee it but uh but i i just say it starts to become so yeah, you know part of the way we understand the world and always you know black people we internalize it like it's so yes <laughs> thank you for that yeah, so maybe I'll read the, the, the next question from Costanza Salazar, unless you want, you want to ask it yourself, Costanza. Um, well, often the work of decolonization only falls on BIPOC scholars and curators. How can we begin to think about a decolonization as a goal for institutions as a whole, and for everyone to think about it as a goal, rather than to have the job so, solely fall on you? How do we create allies and white scholars and curators to help with the difficult job of decolonization? Um, wow, Costanza, yeah, um, like, I, 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 we only have a minute, a few minutes, I almost want to share a personal, like, response, which is just, when I dreamt of becoming a geneticist and a bioanthropologist, I wanted to do exactly that, I loved the science, um, and then it was kind of like, you know, reading, and I had some really conventional, because I'm old school, really old school classes at Yale and anthropology, and just reading this, reading this, I was like, oh, you know, I have to go study this history of physical anthropology. I have to do the, the race science. I wanted to, but I also felt like I had to. So I, I, I hear you. Um, well, let's just be optimistic and say conversations like this one, these these that are happening. Um, you know, having more people at the table when institutions uh, are are discussing how they make changes. Like I said, I, Allison, I'm probably embarrassing her, but she's here. Um, you know, having her at the table in our conversations and special collections and rep, you know, representing um, a, an indigenous perspective. Like I, I, we need more people at the table uh, with our, our, with BIPOC and non-BIPOC folks at the table um, to create change. It's slow, but let's be optimistic. There's certainly a lot of things happening now in these, these, these days. Um, since we don't have a lot of time, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll ask the next two questions together because they kind of go together. So for my colleague, Jean Brody wants to know, um, are, is there a particular museum which you think has a, success, a successful Africa, African art exhibit? Um, Ted Museum, Africa. Yeah. <laughs> I'm invested, but I think it did some radical things. Okay, yes, go ahead. Otherwise, uh, beyond that, beyond Penn Museum, what was the, what would be the first thing about ethnographic ways? What was the first thing you would change 
about ethnographic ways of, um, of presenting the past. In, in I, I want to shout this from the rooftops, dioramas, get rid of them. And I was just, especially ones, well, no, I mean, and this is odd because Franz Boas, you know, contributed this to this idea of wanting life groups in museums because people weren't connecting objects to, to people. Visitors weren't collecting objects to people. Um, but they, this, I mean, I, I, I shudder, like at thinking about all of the school children that go past the dioramas of the African pygmies and, and um, at the, at, it's at a very central corridor at the American Museum of Natural History. I mean, it makes me ill. Like how, you know, how are these representations um, still like, well, I know I, cause I'm working there, why, why they're still up, but we have to change those. We have to, we, I think mixing contemporary art, contemporary life <laughs> images, videos, you know, with some of, you know, we can't do this, the static culture thing um, anymore. You know, there's a, there's a, you know, there's a, Joe Hannesberg and in Nairobi and you know it's 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 it, it Lagos like it's uh there's there's many ways in which like ethnographic or anthropological exhibitions can change <laughs> and need to um maybe, let me because Talene did you have you had your hand up I let's ask let a student ask a question if, if you'd still like to uh hi um this might just be because I I'm not coming from like a museum or art history class, but you mentioned teleological color-coded progress like a couple times. I was just wondering if you could explain what that is. I was unfamiliar with the term. Sure. Um, uh, it's like a teleological is is I, I don't I don't it's from evolution and from and then from in bioanthro. It's like uh, something that's predetermined or or destined. So looking at like the way humans have evolved linear, linearly, linearly towards one common goal um, as like a predetermined, like this is, a, a, you know, linear predetermined goal. It's teleological. Um, I think that's, that's most simply how, how I'm using it. And then I'll ask, uh, thank you, um, uh, kind of running through these quickly, but we got like three minutes and Dr. Kolsky does not let us go late. Um, let me ask a question from the great Elizabeth Rodini, who's joining us. If we understand museums as fundamentally colonial in their essence, have you encountered any museums outside of Euro-Americans, the Euro-American sphere that are, that represent alternative slash successful models for collection and display? Are there, what, what lessons might Western museums draw from those? I also, yeah, that's a really good question. There are non-colonial museums within the United States. I will just say, like, I also use M sometimes, like the capital M museum as like one structure, but we have the Colored Girls Museum here in Philadelphia, which is phenomenal. We have large, we have, we have, we have smaller museums. We have a tremendous art galleries and, and you know, activist, um, artists that are, are producing work um just to just to say like we're often thinking of the you know the capital m these big encyclopedic museums but there are different different kinds of, of museums and galleries um you know i i you know most of my work was in kenya and and in traditional like the national museums of kenya and they because it was put up by the leakies they still it, it was still reproducing some of these same ideas. I would like, there are new museums going up, you know, in, in Nigeria and, and uh, there's new, a big new museum in South Africa. I would love to see what they're doing. Art museums can, I think, do more. <laughs> you know, it's hard. Anthropology is, is having its crisis of identity at the, or has had one for the past hundred, two years, you know, and I think it's right alongside museums kind of having a crisis of identity. But I think there's art galleries and, and other types of history, cultural institutions that are doing much more and better. Elizabeth, do we have time for one more? That is that is up to uh, Dr. Scott. Sure. Okay, um, I'll read the next one from Cristobal Borges, which is, um, I started recently, uh, I have recently started using Foka Lanao's process of decolonization scholarship with my classes 
as a way to get to the, at discussions of allowing space for dreaming of what a future post D beyond colonialization could look like. Those are all slashes there. It can be very stimulating, but invari invariably leads to discussions of what can be quote practi practical or doable. I noticed that, that reimagining is key to the work that you do. How do you navigate the obstacles often thrown at this work by institutions that ask us to bring forth the solution when we point out a problem, but we are not given the space tool, the space or tools to, to dream or to imagine? That's a beautiful question. Oh my gosh. I don't know if I have, a, have time. It, it sends me many different places. Um, I don't know if that work, Allison probably does. <laughs> um, but I, I just like your thinking of dreaming and reimagining because you know I'm in a community here in Philadelphia with some amazing Black museum people and artists and and friends and I do I think I think dreaming is is significant you know in 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 what we do we have to believe in it um, and um, but. I also, you know, I've been helped by the fact that I was trained in museums or you know, worked in museums because I think the practical is important. And I try to communicate this to students is that, you know, unless we're completely dismantling the museums, we, we have to think about what is possible. And I'm going to go back to, you know, this, you know, the Penn Museum having to Khufu Zuberi uh, be the curator for that exhibit who was a dreamer and very informed scholar, um, but he was out, he was not an anthropologist. He was someone from the outside. So he was able to imagine things that the museum itself <laughs> couldn't imagine. And we executed them in very difficult ways and back and forth. Um, but I do, I really like this, this, this kind of uh, negotiation intersection of, 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 of dreaming and doing. Um, I know that's not, you know, how do we do it? It's hard, but it, I think it, it can be done. And I want us to keep space for dreaming. Beautiful. Thank you, um, Scott. I am going to just end us on that. Like also just note that we're, we're bridging right to our next event. The conversation about museums is right a long one we could we could carry on here i'm sure for you know another hour at least so i just want to take this opportunity to thank you um dr monique scott for joining us today and to thank my colleague tim mccall for organizing this uh, this uh entire series of events and i really hope all of you you've, you've posed so many thought-provoking questions in the chat um, I think that the conversation can continue next Wednesday. The whole focus is on decolonizing museums on Wednesday, March 10th at 6 p.m. We have a really interesting and diverse panel of scholars, including Dr. Dan Hicks, who works both in a museum and in academia and wrote a very powerful book called The Brutish Museums. Um, we have uh, Dr. Ruba Kanan, who I saw in the audience tonight, who's a founding team member of the um, Aga Khan Museum in Toronto, as well as a professor of Islamic art and architecture. And we also have Chedria Labouvier, who um, curated the incredible um, Basquiat's defacement show at Guggenheim in 2019, and was the first black curator in the museum's 80 year history. So we will have a lot to talk about. We really look forward to seeing you all next week. You hope, we hope you'll stay with us. Um, Tim, any closing thoughts from you? I, I just want to thank Dr. Scott. That was um, really, really great. And I know my students will I have a lot to talk about with, with some of them in the next few days. Thank okay, you. wonderful. So thank you so much. We'll see you all next week. The video for this event will be posted on our website within a week or so. Thank you to um, Brian Sirac, and we'll see you all next week. <laughs>